Amen. Church, hey, before you take a seat, say hi to five people. Say hi to five people before you take a seat. That's one. That's one. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> amen, amen. Give him a hug, give him a high five. As you take your seats, as you take your seats, go ahead and bring out your Bibles. Go ahead and bring out your Bibles. Stay, stay. Bring out your Bibles. We're going to be going back to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Y'all love saying hi to each other. I like it. The spirit is alive in this morning. Amen, amen. Uh, Psalm 16 is, we're going to be camping out one more time this week. Uh, we're going to be beginning at verse 1. Psalm 16, verse 1. It says this, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints of the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Verse 4, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. But the Lord is my chosen portion. Amen. He is my cup. My, you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. I love that language. For you will not abandon my soul, to, my, my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. And then verse 11, you make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen, amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Dear Father, we truly believe and we truly know that it is in your presence and in your presence alone is where we find pleasures forevermore. You are the truth. You are the way. You are the life. Now, Father, reveal your truth to us today. Show us the way today. Give us life in your name today. Father, there are many of us who have different needs, and Lord, you are the God who speaks to every single one of those needs. Father, speak to couples, speak to individuals, speak to uh, moms and dads and uh, whoever that, that may be, those who are here in person or those who are watching online at this time. You are the God who was able to speak. So do what you do best, which is to move and to do good. We love you and we thank you. In Christ's perfect, wonderful name is who we pray. Amen, amen, and amen, amen. Hey, give it up for the worship team one more time. Give it up for the worship team. Man, it was good today. Hey, just want to remind you guys, we do have the Lord's Supper. If you do not have a Lord's Supper cup, uh, go ahead and wave your hand. The ushers, they'll take care of you and get you hooked right on up. Well, this time of year, we always do an annual Prime to Pump. If you've been a part of our church for a while, you already know what this is all about. If this is your first time hearing about this, one thing we believe that, that here at Christ Church, that our call is to live a generous life. That God has called us to a lifestyle of generosity. And that lifestyle of generosity means being the people who reach people. Right? At the end of the day, you know, God has given and equipped you with a, with a certain sense of uniqueness. That you were not just something that was created by accident. But God uniquely has uh, uh, gifted you to be able to be a blessing to others. And every year, we do a prime to pump offering about what it looks like to bless others here at our campus or just our church as a whole. We got a lot of things we want to do here in the whole Brooklyn community, right? We don't just want to be a place where we come and meet on Sundays, but that we go out into the, uh, the, the neighborhoods, into the schools, uh, into wherever it may be, and we become a blessing to them. So we have this card right here, and this card is for, for those who you feel like, you know what? 
I, I want to be a part of what that looks like to make a difference in our world, in our community, in our streets. Uh, I, I want to be a part of that. And if that's you, Go ahead and take this card. It, it, it's going to be specialized for you. When, when it comes to partnering with us as a church, you know, we believe that only God can compel the giver, right? We, we believe that, 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 that only God can uh, move in someone's heart and spirit to, to be generous. So, and we believe that God loves a cheerful giver and being a part of what uh, the church wants to be doing in their cities. Amen? Amen. All right. So today we're going to be continuing And finishing up a sermon series we started last week, Unshakable Confidence. You sound very excited. You sound sound like you have no confidence. Let's say that one more time. This this sermon series, we're going to be finishing uh, uh, today in Psalm 16. I love this sermon series. I I interrupted our uh, study in the book of James just to do this series, not because I was bored with James. I do want you to know that. Like, I love the Bible. Like, I really do love the, all 66 books. I love it. But I was like, you know what? I think God is calling me to speak on something different. And, and what I love about this sermon series is that it, it, it meets a felt need here in our, at our church, right? right? Some of you don't know, I, I get a chance to sit down with a lot of people. When I say a lot of people, I end this up with a lot of people. A lot of you guys I've gotten to sit down with, and there's one thing that everyone has in common that somebody's getting hit with something, right? Somebody's getting hit with something, whether that's a diagnosis, whether that's divorce, whether it's something going on in their personal life. I mean, you name it, somebody's getting hit with something, and the constant blows of that something or the constant blows of life Empty us of confidence. We said this last week, and I'll say it again. Confidence lately feels fleeting, right? Confidence feels like, like it's, remember the joke I said last week? Confidence feels like Ohio's weather. You know, it's, it's 71 degrees one day, and you're planting your garden, you know, in the middle of February. And then the next day, you're, you're shoveling your, <laughs> your driveway of the snow, right? And that's sometimes how, how our confidence meter works. Right, some days we're good, some days we're, 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 we're not so good. And, and today, I want you to know that, that, uh, uh, that each and every one of us have, have different needs, but God is the God who's able to speak into those specific needs. See, Jesus Christ speaks to our felt needs because he lives in our place of need. Does that make sense? He's able to speak to to, to those things. See, God is not a God that just sits back and just allows your life to be life and allows you to get beat up and trampled over, but rather he's a God who draws near and who wants to speak into the areas of real need and reminds you that he is what you ultimately need. Does that make sense? Right? I know that was a mouthful, so I apologize. We're coming out the gate hot. So much I love this sermon series. So I'm, I'm excited for today. So you just got to deal with my excitement, all right? Right? That, that, that God draws near, that God desires to draw near. The Bible says he is near the brokenhearted. He wants to save those who are crushed in spirit, right? And, and this sermon series is to remind you uh, uh, that, that God speaks to those areas of life. Now, we've been... Uh, studying through Psalm 16, uh, a psalm of David. David was a, 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 an ancient king of Israel, the second king of Israel, a great king, amazing king, did some great things and had some not so great moments in his life as well. But this particular psalm, or what the psalms, what they normally were, they were times where the, the people of Israel would come together and they would sing these psalms. You know how we're like reading them and studying them? They would literally sing them out loud, right? This wasn't like done how we do it today. The people would gather and they would sing these words. Now, what's interesting about Psalm 16, I want to teach you something. Remember, put on your, put on your hats today. Tie up with your children. thinking hats, all right? So I want to teach you something today. This is what they call a psalm uh, that's a miktam. Look at your Bibles. It probably says a miktam of David. Probably see that right at the very top, right by the heading. A miktam of David. What's a miktam? Well, in Israel, a miktam is something uh, that, that is understood as golden, 
right? Or the, the best way to relate to this, it's, it's meant to cover, right? And there's a couple miktam uh, uh, psalms that we see in the book of Psalms, right? This is one of them. It's a special, unique psalm. Why? Because it's meant to cover. The idea that's behind this, this covering is to cover in the time of peril, to, to cover in the time of distress, now, here's what we realized that we talked about last week, and we're going to talk about it again this week. This is a psalm of confidence, a psalm that's meant to give you confidence. And what's, what does Miktam and confidence have in common? That God desires to cover your soul with confidence. Does that make sense? That God desires to cover your spirit and your heart with a deep sense of confidence, that God desires to cover your spirit but confidence in the areas where you feel a little bit uncertain, that God desires to, to, to cover your, your heart with confidence in the areas where you feel like you're about to give up, that God desires to fulfill your heart with confidence uh, 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 in those moments to, to cover you wherever you are struggling the most. Anybody struggling? Anybody feel like they just got things that are hitting them left and right? Well, this psalm is meant to speak confidence into your life. It's meant to speak true confidence and true contentment in your life. And if you think about confidence, we all, we all desire it. We all want it. Right? Nobody wakes up and says, I don't want to be courageous today. Nobody does that. Nobody gets out of bed and says, you know, today is going to be a mediocre day. I'm just going to be my worst self. I'm not going to do anything great or special. I'm just going to be mad, negative, and everything else. Right? No. Right? We, we all innately are designed to, to want and to feed off courage and confidence, but we just have a hard time achieving it. As a matter of fact, I read a study I talked about that over 70% of people who have either struggle with mental health, struggle with behavioral uh, issues, who have relational issues as well too, most of them, it's due to a shattered sense of confidence, right? It's due to a shattered sense of confidence. And what Psalm 16 teaches us that, that Psalm 16, it teaches us about confidence and contentment, that it's only in our relationship with the Lord we are redeemed to a true sense of confidence, right? Because the confidence God wants to give us is not a momentary confidence, it's a sustaining confidence. It's not a confidence that makes you feel good in the moment, right? That, that just only makes you feel good in the moment, but it's a confidence that helps you to face tomorrow. It's a confidence that makes, helps you to face Tuesday, Right? Everybody complains about Monday. I think Tuesdays are worse than Mondays sometimes, all right? Right? It's a confidence that, that gets you through and through, and that's what God wants to do in you today. And this is what we call an unshakable confidence. Doesn't that sound cool? An unshakable confidence. And, and, right? And I, I was thinking about the other day, I drove past the, the tattoo parlor. I was like, I should get a tattoo that says unshakable confidence. Then I called my wife. She's like, you better get back home right now. And I said, okay, all right. Happy wife, happy life. So, uh, <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> I didn't get it, guys. Relax, relax, relax. Did he get it? No, I did not. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but we talked about this, that unshakable confidence is this. If you take it down notes, write this down. Unshakable confidence is the ability to face uncertainty adversity, danger, or suffering with a faith-fueled hope that God will keep his word to us come what may be. I know that's a mouthful, right? But, but, but this is the, the very truth, that, that unshakable confidence is the ability to face uncertainty, to face adversity, to, to, to face danger with a faith-fueled hope that God will keep his word to us. Isn't that awesome? Don't you love that? that? That God will keep his word to us, come what may be. Pretty much this confidence God wants to give you is a confidence that, that no matter what happens in your life, you will not be defeated. Right? It's a confidence that, that you will not stop. 
You will not stop trusting in God. You will not stop caring for your family. You will not stop doing the things that God has called you to do. You will not stop. Yes, you're getting punched in the mouth, and you got another punch, you got another jab, you got an uppercut, and you got all this happening in your life, but you're still the one standing on your feet saying, but I trust God to fulfill what he's called to do in my life. Right? How many of us want to live like that? <laughs> I don't know about, right, all of us, we, how many of us, we want to we wanna have a confidence that says, yeah, you can say this, you can say that, you can turn your back on me, the doctor can say whatever they want to say, but I trust in God. And that's the life that God wants you to have. That this, this is, the, this is the, the confidence God wants you to have in your life, right? And, and, and it's in our difficulty, haven't we noticed that that it's in our difficulty where we face the harsh reality that we're helpless without God. Isn't that true? Right? In the midst of our difficulty, what speaks more in our difficulty other than fear and frustration and doubt, what speaks even more is our need for God. Right? Right? I'll never forget reading in a book that talked about the beauty of pain. No, it was a very interesting book. It was, it was written by a, a Catholic priest. It was, but, but, but what he talked about in his book was this idea that, that sometimes it's those painful moments that gets us to God even more. That it's the uncertainty, that it's the, the trauma, that it's in those moments where we are reminded how much we need God. Because you do know Christianity is not God at work in you to get to a place to a point where you don't need him anymore. You know that, right? No, Christianity is not, hey, work up to the point where you're not struggling with sin, where you're not struggling with brokenness. No, Christianity is you constantly acknowledging how much you need God. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm a, hey, listen, there's, there's no such thing as I, or, or I have arrived at the place of, of perfection. No, I'm a broken man. And in my brokenness and in my sin and in my dysfunction, I need a holy Savior who loves me, who is for me, who is with me, who is working in me, all of that. Our pain speaks to our hearts, yes, many things, but the greatest thing is that our need is God, right? To find the beauty of pain, right? I don't recommend that book because it's like, oh, my gosh, like, I never thought about pain in that certain way. It convicted me. But I never thought about pain in that way at all. So let's go ahead and read Psalm 16. Let's go ahead and start in verse 7. Last week we just did 1 through, uh, one through 6. Uh, today we're going to do 7 through 11. So let's go ahead and start in verse 7. It says this. Bring it up for us, Logs. It says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also my heart instructs me. You know what I do a lot at night? It's overthink. Anybody like me? Anybody have a hard time falling asleep because you're thinking about the day, you're thinking about tomorrow, right? And then your spouse comes out and says, you need to go to bed. Shut up. I don't need to go to bed. I just, I'm fine, right? And you tell yourself, you need to go to bed, you know, and you're like, but you keep thinking about that thing, right? David experiences the same thing. David says, at night, my heart is troubled. At night, I can't stop dwelling on the situation, right? We are professional overthinkers, am I right? We're really good at overthinking. That's all we do is overthink. And what happens in the overthinking? We create scenarios do, that do not exist. Do, not, do we not do that, right? We create scenarios that, that do not exist. The other day, I was overthinking about something with, about the kids, and for somehow, some reason, I went from thinking one thought to next you know they're in foster care. Like, I don't, I don't know, how, how does this happen, right? How do you go from zero to 100, right? And David says, it's, it's at night, my heart, my heart instructs me, my heart tells me to seek God. That's what he says. He says, my, my heart tells me that, that in the midst of this struggle that I'm going through, you need to go to the Lord. And what do you need to go to the Lord for, friends? What, what does David talk about? And I love this portion. David says, I, I seek the Lord for counsel. Or another way to say this in the Hebrew, uh, 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 I seek the Lord for wisdom. I seek the Lord. Uh, at point number one, 
Confidence begins with you and I seeking God for wisdom, right? We need to seek God for, for, for counsel or for wisdom, right? Now, if you were with us uh, uh, during uh, the holiday seasons, you remember we did the, the study on Isaiah 9? Remember that? I know you guys remember every sermon I do, so don't worry. I know you're the, you're the faithful. But uh, we did a sermon series on Isaiah 9 where it talked about the, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Remember that sermon series? Remember that portion we preached on the wonderful counselor? Well, that same word in Isaiah, counselor, is actually the same Hebrew word here for counsel in Psalm 16, right? It's the same idea. Now, what's the, what's the meaning of, of what the, the counsel or the wisdom God wants to give you? Well, the counsel that, God, that comes from God is meant to change your perspective, right? Because if you ever notice, life is all about perspective, right? You, 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 you can't change the scene, but you can change your perspective, right? You can't change the circumstance. You can't change and undo the pain. You can't undo, you can't undo what somebody did, but you can frame it in a way by faith and faith alone. You can frame it in a way that, that changes your perspective. And, and, I, and I've noticed this. If you learn how to change your perspective to a faith perspective, it changes your life, right? Right? Because, again, we'll tell ourselves one thing, But faith speaks a whole different language. Faith says this, pain says that, right? And the counsel that God wants to give you is to help you and I to change our perspective. I'll never forget a couple years ago, uh, a couple people from the staff, we went to a pastoral conference, and this big wig pastor comes up. I mean, some of you have probably watched his sermons, read his books. I mean, he comes right on up. There's probably like... 500 pastors in the room. I mean, it's, it's packed. It's, it's, right? And the first thing he says when he gets up to the stage, he says, if you are in ministry today, if you are a pastor, here's what you guys need. And we're all ready to write it down. We all got our notebooks out, iPads. And he says, you all need counseling. And I said, what did he just say to us? He doesn't even know me like that. Like, I paid a little $50 for this, and you're going to tell me I need counseling? I got a wife that can tell me that. I mean, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? I need counseling. What you, what you talk about? And you can just tell, like, dead silence. Dead silence in the whole room. Everybody, like, every guy's turning their head like, is he talking to you? Or he's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's talking to you over there. No, he ain't talking to me. Right? Right? He says, says that you need counseling. Now, when we hear the word counseling, it makes us cringe, doesn't it? Right? Right? Maybe some of you have tried it, and you're like, uh, this isn't for me. I don't like talking about this, right? I don't need to talk about that. What's what's the use of doing all of this? But what's the point of counseling? Well, we all know that the point of counseling uh, or good counseling is to unpack your current reality. And you unpack your current reality that that gives you a greater perspective so that you can live differently than what you're uh, uh, living, how you're living at that moment, right? Counseling helps us to cope, right? Counseling helps us to process, right? Now, I do want to say this, that counseling and my expertise, if, if, if it means anything, right, little old pastor here in Cleveland, Ohio, like, counseling's good. Let me just say that, right? Some of you, it's been seven years past due since you needed counseling, right? Right? Some of us, like, well, God, help me. All right, I'm helping you. I'm sending someone to you. <laughs> or I'm sending you to someone, Right? We, we, we need counseling, right? Counseling is good, especially Christian counseling, right? Someone who knows Jesus, who loves Christ, right? But here's what David says. I see God in the same light, that God is the one who counsels my soul. See, friends, we need God's help in unpacking the traumas and the emotions and the overthinking that we have in our life so that God can give you and I a greater perspective God's way of counseling, when, when he comes to, to us, when his word and his spirit speaks to us, his way of counseling is to, to move us out of the thing that's weighing us down, to move out of the thing that's dominating the thoughts, 
to move us out of the, the, the area that is causing mastery on our souls. This is the idea of seeking God's counsel. But not only is he, is he there to, 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 to move us towards, uh, move us out of whatever is weighing us down, but God's heart is to encourage you. Right? I love the Apostle Paul when he says in 1 Thessalonians, may the God of all encouragement... God is an encouraging God. God, listen, God is a life coach. God, God loves to sit there and tell you that all that you need to hear so that your heart may be encouraged, right, to trust him. That's the language God speaks. Trust me, right? Trust me. Haven't I given you enough excuses? Haven't I worked enough in your life? Trust me, Right? See, the counsel of God, I love this one pastor. He says, God's counsel or God's way of encouraging you, it, it restores you to sanity. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? God, 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 God's counsel, God's wisdom, God's working, when we seek him, his way of encouraging us, it restores us to sanity. It brings us to the true reality, a greater perspective in that moment at that time. So when you're, when you're up tonight worrying about whatever it may be, seek the Lord, right? Seek the Lord in those moments. Seek the Lord at that time. And you'll find yourself uh, 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 catching on to a greater truth, to a greater reality that gives you a greater way to live than what you're actually facing at that moment. Right? He says, I bless the Lord who counsels me. God, yes, he is your Lord, he is your creator, but he also is your counselor. Yeah, God is your counselor. You can go to God and say, God, I am struggling right now. What do you want me to do? Right? That, 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 that's like, that delights God for you to come up to him and say, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to go about this? Right? It, it delights God to, to hear you speak and ask him for things that you need because he loves to fulfill your needs. He loves to meet your needs. He loves to help you, right? He loves to encourage you. He loves to remind you of his great purpose and his great promises. How does God shape our perspective? Well, he changes our perspective by reminding us of his great promises, right? Here, here's the one thing that encourages my soul and my spirit even more is when I go to the promises of God. The promises of God is what gives life. And he changes our perspective by reminding us his very great promise. And what's the great promise? David talks about it in verse 8, that God is present. Look what he says in verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Some of your translations, this is a very literal way of saying this. Some of your translations may say, I, I, have, I allow the Lord to guide me, Right? I have set the Lord before me because, watch this, this is interesting. Notice he says, I've set the Lord before me, and he's at my right hand. Isn't that interesting? You ever, you ever see the, the word play in that? I set the Lord before me, and he's at my right hand. Now, some commentators, what they'll say is, when David says, at my right hand, David was probably right-handed, which, which would have meant it was his strong hand, but, but God has his right hand because God is a stronger hand. Right? God is a, stronger, is a stronger strength, right? There's some commentaries that say that, but I believe this speaks to the omnipresence of God, that God, God is not only someone who is with you, but God is also before you, right? God is not only with you or before you, but he's in you. He exists within you. The Spirit of God lives in you, moving, you, helping, you, strengthening, you, Right? I believe David hit something that's so beautiful. But did you see how the verse ends? I shall not be shaken. Right? He says, I will not let fear dominate. I will not let worry dominate. But I shall not be shaken. Why? Because confidence begins with knowing that God is near. That God is near. A couple weeks ago, I uh, took my son to the, uh, to the ER uh, my wife and I, we noticed on his index finger, we noticed his finger was very swollen. It was like two of my thumbs. Like it was, 
It was bad, right? And, you know, we, we, we didn't really know what to do with it when we first saw it, so we slept on it. Great parents, I know. So we slept on it, and then we woke up the next morning, and we we're like, we need to take him to the ER. He had a bunch of, like, kind of pus and white stuff. Hopefully that doesn't disgust you. And so we take him to the ER, and here I am. I'm at the ER for four and a half hours with a toddler. I'm going to sit up right, by myself. Yes, he is right. By myself. Four and a half hours with the toddler in the ER. And so we, we get to this point, and uh, 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 the, the doctor does CAT scan, does an X-ray, come to find out he had a splinter in there, and uh, the splinter stayed in there, and it caused an infection and, and all of that. Uh, but the doctor said, Mr. Anderson, before you leave, we have to get the, we, we have to get the infection out. We got to get the bacteria out. So you know what I'm thinking? We have to hold him down for this, <laughs> right? And some of you know, taking kids to the doctors, it's not, it's not great, right? It's, it's not wonderful. Literally, like an army came in. <laughs> you had three nurses, a guy that goes to our church who works at that hospital came in too, right? They're numbing his finger. And my son's just sitting there like, ah, all, all these people, it's a party. He's like, no, bro, it's about to get bad. But, uh, and so the, the nurse says, hey, I, I have to cut some of the infection out. This is going to be very painful to him, right? And so I, I come up to him, and we're about to lay him down. And he starts to get scared. He went from joy, and he went got scared. Reality set in. Oh, they're here to do something, right? So we, we lay him down, and the first thing he does, he covers his eyes. <laughs> I'm like, no, son, they're not working on your eyes. He said, oh. <laughs> and they stretch out his finger, and they're like, you know, I can see the nurse you know, tightening, holding his his arms so he doesn't move because they need to get it out. And the first thing he said was, Daddy, what are they doing? I said, son, this is going to be painful. This is going to hurt. You're not going to like this. But I'm with you. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. And he says, please don't go. I said, son, I'm not going anywhere. And I could tell as they started... Uh, 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 I could tell uh, um, they were beginning to get the infection out. He began to tense up. And he began to lift up, and he kept trying to look at his finger because he wanted to look at his pain. He wanted to look at what was happening. And I said, no, son, look at your father. Look at your dad. Look at me. Just look right at me. And he says, dad, please don't leave me. I said, son, I'm right here. I got you. I know this hurts. I keep telling him, I know this hurts, but I'm with you. And then next you know, the doctor says, all done. And then I say, all done? And then my son says, all done? And then the doctor says, yeah, all done. And he jumps on the table. He says, I am Batman. I am the Dark Knight. I'm like, man, I am indoctrinating my kid, man. It's, uh, geez, we love Jesus. We love Michael Jordan is the greatest player, and Batman is the greatest superhero ever, Right? But it was the proudest dead moment of my life. Why? Because he was able to face the fear. He was able to face how uncomfortable it was. He was able to, to, to face the, the pain in that moment. Not, not, not because, you know, he's just wild and crazy. He has a, a high sense of tolerance. No, because he knew that his father was near. His father was above him and with him and close to him. He, he knew this, so he was able to say, I can do this, not because I'm so good, but because my father is right here with me, right? I, I, you know, I often wonder why Jesus always says you should have a childlike faith. I always wonder that, because you know what's very interesting? You know, my son, when I'm about to take him to school, he never asked me before I take him to school, do I know where I'm going? He ne he never, he's never done that before. He's never has done like, like hey, Daddy, do you, should you take a right? Should you take a left? I think you should go this way. He trusts securely in me, right, to get him to where he needs to be, right? He, he knows, he knows that, that, that Dad's going to get me to where I am going. And what if you and I had a childlike faith today that trusted that God, listen, listen, I, I, I may feel this, but I know this. I'm experiencing this, but I, this is the great reality, that you know where you're going, and you're with me as we're going. What, what if that was our faith that we held on today? 
What if that was the confidence that we, that, that we walked in tomorrow? That yes, we're in the situation, but God is in it too. But not only are we in the situation, there is another destination that God is getting us to as well too. What, what, what if that was our faith? That we said that he is with me, he's at my right hand, but he's also before me. He's also leading me. What if that was the way that we live? That changes the game, friend. That changes our attitudes. That changes our relationships. That changes the way we see life. When we say to ourselves, God is before me, but he's also with me as well. Now, I know this is very interesting before we close. You know, that means like 20 more minutes, by the way. But, you know, you know I find it very interesting that David shows us one, another way of how we can find confidence. And if you notice that throughout the psalm, David has, has been committing himself to the Lord, right? You, you notice David says, I, as the saints for the land, I, those are the ones who I delight in. I will not run after other gods. I will bless the Lord. I will uh, 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 come to the Lord. I will draw near to him. You know one thing that I feel that how David finds confidence Now, listen to me when I say this, because this is very important. I believe David was able to find a true sense of confidence when he learned how to let go of control. Right? When he learned to let go. I was walking uh, uh, yesterday through through, through the metro parks, and I felt this deep sense of, like, tension. Which, I'm like, why, why do I feel angry right now? Why do I feel this tension, right? Why, why do I feel that? And, and, and for some reason, I, I just, I felt that the Lord was pressing in my heart that there are just some things, some of the reasons why you have constant fear and resentment is because you want life to look a certain way when I've called it to look this way. And you need to learn how to let it go, right? You need to learn how to let it go. And maybe for a lot of us, See, one thing that we're in constant friction with, if, if it's not with ourselves, it's with God. Right? God, I want it to look this way. So what do we do? We try to maneuver and manipulate it to look our way. God, I, I want it to go that way. I, I should be married at this time in my life. I should be done with school at this time. I should have this job. I should have that job. I should have all this. Uh, God, you, you know, we're going to make it look like this. And God's like, No. I'm God, <laughs> right? And the one thing that I've realized, and maybe, maybe this is a, kind of like speaking something fresh for a lot of us. Some of us, God is telling us, like, let it go, right? Because freedom doesn't happen when you try to, when you try to fight for it. But freedom it just happens when you learn to say, God, I trust you. I trust you with my family, God. I trust you with my marriage, God. I've tried to change my spouse for so many amount of years, but you know what, God? It's in your hands. I've I've tried to to, to make my career look a certain way, but God, my career is in your hands, right? I trust you in this way. What if that was us today, right? And then David ends this psalm in a beautiful, beautiful way, beginning with verse 10. He says, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your holy one see corruption. Some of your Bibles say decay. Listen, friends, I believe confidence also comes with us knowing that everything, I believe this verse speaks in two ways. I believe confident, we can live confidently when we know two things, that everything we experience does not go to waste. Our pain does not go to waste. He said, you will not let your holy one see corruption. You will not let it decay. That there are things in our lives, yes, the great pain is going to produce greater purpose. Right? That, that God's going to produce a, a greater sense of self within you. A greater sense of his presence. A, a greater sense of his, his goodness. A greater sense of, your, uh, of a relationship with him. A, a newer and a fresher you. That God's going to take all that we experience that, that, that he's going to use all of that because he's sovereign. He, he's, he's not only sovereign in the heavens, but he's sovereign in every event in your life. He's not only making sure the world does and functions the way that it needs to, but he's also the God that, that, that functions the same way in your life, right? 
And, and, he's, and, and he's able to command the world to be a certain way, and he's able to command your pain to produce greater purpose in your life as well, too. Some of us, we, we, we need to realize that everything that we're, we're experiencing, God is still working a great purpose in it. But I know a lot of you are probably saying, how can God bring great purpose in this? And I, here's my answer to you, friends. And, and it took me years and years to figure it out. And I just want you to know, I don't know. <laughs> but I do know this. God will not let you down. Right? As a pastor, as a preacher, my job is not to know every answer. My job is just to remind you that Jesus is the answer. Right? That, that's my job. Right? And sometimes we, we, we say to ourselves, man, what, what's going on? Why is this? How can God bring good in this darkest moment? Why would God allow this moment in my life? And friends, it's okay to say, I don't know. We're dealing with the holy God here. I can't figure out everything about him. But the one thing that he has revealed to me is that everything you're experiencing will not go to waste. Will not go to waste. But also there's a second part to this. When David says, you will not let your holy one see decay, this is actually referenced in the book of Acts in the New Testament two or three times. The apostle Peter, when he's given a sermon uh, on the day of Pentecost, on the day the Holy Spirit came down and rained like fire, when the apostle Peter, he's preaching and he's doing amazing things, he uses this psalm to explain why Jesus came to this earth to begin with. He uses this psalm to, to explain why the death of Jesus is necessary, right? But, but when he uses this language, or let your holy one see corruption, I bet you there were, there were the ancient Jews that were probably singing this song like, what is he talking about? Like, this, this makes no sense. David is talking about that, even though that, I, that one day I, I will go to the grave and one day somebody would have to read a, a eulogy at my, my funeral, I will not see corruption, meaning that He's pointing to a greater hope. And what's this hope? If you probably already caught on to it, he's pointing to resurrection. Because Jesus says this, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that who shall ever believe in him shall not what? Perish. Shall not, another word to say that, see decay shall not perish, but have eternal life. Here's, here's, here, here's, here's what I believe David does. A thousand years before Jesus, by the way, he prophesies resurrection. That there would be one that would come, and all the brokenness and all the madness and all the, the things that were happening in our lives, resurrection will remind us that there's something better. That this is where our hope is. And resurrection breathes hope and confidence to our souls. Just a couple weeks, we're going to celebrate a man who, are in, who was in the grave for three days. And Jesus, he's not only alive, but he's alive in us. That's why a resurrection matters. He's not just alive. He's not just out of the tomb. But now he's in this temple. Now he reigns here. This is why the resurrection is important. All we think that I just said, you forgot about, that's fine. But the one thing we must get right is that through death, Christ killed death. That through death, Christ killed it. Yes, your body will go into the, to the ground one day. But your soul shall be the Lord forever. And one day, when Christ returns, you will be united with that same body. And Christ himself, you will be in his presence forevermore. This is our confidence and our hope. Let's pray. Dear Father, we, we just thank you for this reminder today, Lord that you are our confidence for this life. That, Father, we can look to you and trust in you and know that you are good and that you do good and you always will be good. 
That, Lord, there's, there's nothing in our lives that slips past your grips. That there's, there's nothing in our lives that you are not in control of. So, Lord, we, we pray that we can be people who are constantly reminding ourselves that confidence and freedom happens through surrender and giving up the control we're trying to have more in our lives. Father, we thank you, and Lord, we love you. Sing your son's perfect name until we pray. Amen.